Cameron. It is, uh, my goodness, it's the 4th of September. I, I don't, so happy Labor Day, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Uh, next, next month, it'll be, the leaves will be turning. Um, anyway, good to be with you here, September the 4th. Um, do we know? Yes. Rising Hope. We do. Um, cake mix and frosting, and okay. that will go in the Thanksgiving and Christmas baskets. Okay. Cake mix and frosting. Um, and so we would appreciate that very much. That goes into Thanksgiving boxes. Um, let's see here. Um, Joe also told me that September 19th. Is the next men's meeting. Okay, September 19th is the next men's meeting. Dinner, cool. meal, and time TBD. Okay, and then do we have any Koinonia news for September? Not as of yet. Okay, we'll be, we'll be sending that out as soon as we know about September. Okay. Wow, September. <laughs> no. um, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we give thanks this morning for this opportunity to worship you, to fellowship with one another, and to hold each other accountable in Christian love. As we come together, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins, wash us clean of our inequities, open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. Help us to be joyful in our obedience and faithful to your commandments and laws and lessons. We pray this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Um, uh, number, first hymn this morning, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Uh, number 139. And, and uh, we've got Tom Selleck with us here today. So we're very, very glad, glad to have you with us. Uh, uh, we're we're going to sing verses 1 and 5. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I do with you as I do? Did with this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and destroy it, 
if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil. I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said it would benefit. Now therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. 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 A reading from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it altogether. You pursue me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inner parts, inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for you are fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your books were written in the days that were formed for me every day before they came into being. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Amen. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to Philemon, verses 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Athia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. <coughs> Grace to you and, <coughs> and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, <clears throat> hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Jesus Christ. For we have a great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. 
If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, our second hymn for today um, is uh, Have Thine Own Way. Number 382, we're going to sing verses 1 and 4. <laughs> St. Luke chapter 14 verses 25 through 33. Now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of our Lord. <laughs> I've gone to the doctor on two antibiotics. Um, it's it's uh, it's been a kind of tiresome and, and a tough week, so much so that uh, uh, against my my own mother's I know wishes, I have worn stripes and plaid this morning, which I know I'm sorry. I'm just going to confess that to the church, and also uh, you'll notice my tie is tied a little too short today as well, so I'm having to keep that kind of tucked in. It's a little, a little discombobulated. Um, these are wonderful passages, and um, um, I'm, I'm focusing very hard because uh, these are incredibly important passages. And um, uh, 
I, I want to be very careful here, and I, and I, I say this often. Um, my calling and my uh, job, my prof my profession, is to preach uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and of course to expound upon what the scriptures have and how to apply them to our lives. I am incredibly careful and make a concerted effort to draw a line not to venture into politics, especially from the pulpit. Um, for one thing, that's simply not my job. Um, my, yeah, they do not pay me to get up here and give my opinion on politics because I, I mean, I have a, a bachelor's in political science, which, you know, you can throw a rock and hit one of those. They're worthless. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's nothing, no big deal. Um, so it makes me no expert whatsoever. And, and I, I'm, you know, my, my graduate degrees are all in theology and, and divinity. And, and so, you know, I'm being literally paid to talk about the thing which I am trained as an expert in. Um, I am not trained as a political expert. I don't have any qualifications as such. My opinions are no more valid than any other Americans. And um, as uh, I also believe that as a matter of conscience, it would be an abuse of my position as a pastor to weigh in on politics uh, especially from the pulpit, as to endorse um, one candidate or one party uh, as if, you know, God were somehow endorsing them. Because when I speak from the pulpit as a minister, I'm supposed to be speaking on God's behalf. That's, that's the calling. That's the ordination. And so I don't do that. Um, now, that doesn't mean I don't have opinions. Of course I have opinions. And my parishioners who've gotten to know me well over the years know that I have very strong opinions, especially on certain issues. Um, I do have, I will speak on certain issues where the church has spoken, okay? If there is a social slash moral issue that is also a theological issue where the church has taken a strong position, um, I'm going to do my best to align myself with the position of traditional Christianity on most issues. Um, so, uh, you know, that's my, I, in some ways I feel like that's my job is to say, here's the church's position on this certain issue. However, that issue is being bandied about politically in the, in, by the current parties in America or elsewhere. That's beyond the, that's beyond the point, but to say, here's the Christian position since antiquity. Here's what the church has voted or ruled on at church councils. That's my position. Uh, at least as a minister, to say this is where the church stands on that. And here's why. Um, but uh, let, let me just say this. There, there has been a great deal of conversation. Uh, and I hear this bandied about saying that, uh, you know, how your, your Christian beliefs influence your political positions, uh, that gets debated. And I hear people, both both Christians and non-Christians, who say, "Well, if you're a Christian, you should not uh, your your beliefs shouldn't be affecting your civil positions because of separation of church and state." Um, I'm going to say this: that is absolute nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. So I want I want to start with, uh, and I want to root this in our scripture today. But I want to. I want us to understand. That here's the basic premise: what you believe about God and your relationship to the Holy Trinity has to be the absolute central to your sense of being, and thus your sense of identity, and how you see the world and how you interact with the world has absolutely has to be influenced by your faith or your faith means nothing. Your faith means nothing. Faith without works is dead. That is what St. James tells us. It's dead. 
what you believe about, about religion is the core of what, how you understand reality and how you understand right and wrong and how you understand how to treat other people. And if that doesn't influence how you go out and act, including at the ballot box, then we are not sincere in our faith. Now, that does not mean that I expect all Christians to vote one party or for the same candidate. I don't. But it does mean that I expect every Christian who is sincere about their faith that their faith ought to be guiding their approach to every issue and how they vote. And so I, I do expect this, that for all of us who take our faith sincerely, at some level, we are having to hold our nose and vote because it's always going to be an imperfect choice. We have to compromise. That's living in the world. And I understand that. And some people may weigh certain compromises differently than others. But all of us, all of us have to be guided by our faith. Ultimately, our morality, what we see as right and wrong, should be shaped foremost by our faith and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about that. Um, today in Jeremiah... Uh, in chapter 18, uh, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. So he went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. Now, you know, we, we presume he's making a bowl or a vase, or, you know, he's spinning that wheel and moving the clay. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. He made a mistake. So, uh, so uh, he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make. So he, you know, started off, I don't know, making a vase, got screwed up, so he just made it into a bowl. Uh, the word of the Lord came and said, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I uh, thought to bring upon it. Now, um, I want to be clear here. Um, he's talking specifically about Israel. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this part? Uh, the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning the kingdom, to plug it in book. So God has, obviously, sovereignty in the world. And can, do, and can act and do in whatever ways he wants to. But he's specifically talking to Israel and telling Israel, um, you're the clay in my hand. You're the clay in my hand. Now, Paul is going to pick this language up in Romans 8 and 9 and talk about, and in Romans 9, the, 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 we're, the, we're the clay earthen vessels uh, is the way I think the old King James or may, and maybe even the Revised Standard puts it earthen vessels. Uh, some of the newer translations will say jars of clay, which is uh, where the name of a very famous Christian band when I was coming up. That's where that comes from. It's from Romans. But the, the idea here is that Paul is referencing this passage of Jeremiah where the Lord talks about Israel being the clay in the potter's hands. Now, understand he also uses that in Romans to talk about, again, the Jews specifically is who Paul is talking about. And he's talking about God's people. Okay? God's people. And we don't talk enough about the distinguishing characteristics of the people of God versus the people of the world. Now, we like to say, I hear this all, aren't we all God's children? Well, yes, we are. But let's not <coughs> overlook the division of sin, that sin breaks humanity, and those of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit has been given to us, and he is actively washing away original sin, 
and working in us to make us like Jesus. That is different from the world, which rejects it. Okay? And so, you know, we have that old saying, the unwashed masses, which people, oh, what a terrible thing to say. Talk uh, that oh, other people are dirt. No, that originally was not referring to people being dirty or poor or anything else. It was referring to the heathens. Uh, and I don't say that in a pejorative sense. Heathen simply means non-Christians. Same as pagan, non-Christians. Okay? And so uh, when, that, you know, when, when Christianity was advancing in Europe and they talked about the unwashed masses, they were talking about all those who were in need of baptism, who had not yet been baptized. Um, we are expected to live differently because we know better. And God has forgiven our sins and set us apart and given us grace and salvation. And we are his redeemed children. Okay? And he expects us to act a little better. Expect, because we know a little better. Um, the rest of the world cannot see right and wrong correctly. They might see it to an extent, but not correctly. We've been given the light of Christ that's only available through revelation, through the Holy Spirit. It, it doesn't just come about naturally. That is a limited view. So, so there's some things... Um, that you know, and, and Wesley will talk about this as prevenient grace. Calvin would call it common grace. How then do non-Christian secular societies or groups? How do they come up with any virtue at all, uh, any idea of right and wrong, if they're not Christian? If they're so broken by sin, where do they get any virtue? Well, uh, Wesley would say that's prevenient grace. Calvin would call it common grace. And basically, it's limited stuff like, well, you, well they know you, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't murder. It's, it's pretty obvious to see that tears down society. When it comes into the, the, the spiritual virtues, like forgive your enemy, like love your neighbor, like all those things that are of a higher order that Christ called us to, that, that doesn't make sense to the world. That doesn't make sense. Okay? So, um, God is telling Jeremiah that he's going to move Israel like a potter's clay because it's not that they are, let's say, uh, less moral than their neighbors. It's that he expects them to be more moral than their neighbors because they have been told better. They've been taught better. He pulled them specifically out of Egypt and gave them the commandments and has sustained them versus all these of the Philistines and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Syrians and all the other people. And he has held them together and given them the commandments and they knew better and were still unfaithful. And, and, and Israel has a responsibility as his chosen people. It's not just, uh, I bless these people so they get to show off and, and just you know, look at us so blessed. It's a responsibility to be a light unto the nations. And through this people, he would bring his Messiah into the world. So they're set apart for the salvation of the world. And when they don't live up to that responsibility, uh, he's got to punish them. Well, the Philistines are just as bad as we are. Well, the Philistines weren't taught like you are. And so just, just I mean, if you're a parent, I'm sure you've heard this. Well, you know, the guys next door get to stay up late. Well, I'm not, I'm not their parent. And in this house, we go to bed at 8 o'clock. Or whatever it is. Uh, probably a little closer to 9, if I'm honest about it. Um, you know, at this house, we do our homework. Okay? Um, we have rules for this house. And... I understand your friends have different rules. I'm not their father. And what God is saying to Israel is, well, the Philistines are a bunch of heathens. I'm not their father. I'm your father. 
And I have a rule for you. And this is the deal. You have a covenant with me as the children of Abraham. And I hold up my end of the deal. And y'all are not holding up your end of the deal. Um, now, you might say, well, well, I mean, you know, they didn't choose that. Well, okay, this is, you know, if, I, if I'm, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm not trying to be political here at all, but in general, people who just complain about America and then they want to stay and live in America and make money as an American, that drives me a little insane. Like, it's, it's okay to be critical and say, I think we should change, you know, certain tax codes, or I think these laws need to be addressed, or I think that, you know, perfect, it's a democracy, of course we need to have those conversations. But the people who want, I hate America, America's terrible, get out. You know, go, go, see how much better you like it in some other country, all right? En enjoy yourself. Um, knock, knock yourself out. Um, and that's kind of what God is saying. Do you like the benefit of my protection? Do you like my grace? Do you like all the thing and protection and come that I come with of being, being a child of Israel? You want to be an Israelite, but you don't want to obey the rules? We'll see about that. We will see about that. And so, of course, what Jeremiah is talking about is the coming Babylonian uh, invasion and the diaspora taking two-thirds of them back to back to Babylon. Um, he's holding them accountable because they are his people. And he expects his people to be different from the world because they know better. Because he's given them the laws. Straight from himself. They're not having to guess about what's right and wrong. Now, we come today to Paul's letter to Philemon. And when I would, I'll be quite honest with you, before I had gone to seminary, I had maybe read through it once and read through it quickly. It's one of these personal letters. I, I never found it a terribly interesting until we got to seminary. And um, coming from the South, uh, an issue that often comes up uh, in debating the merits of Christian morality is the question of slavery and how has the church responded or failed to respond to that issue over uh, these centuries. So uh, let me say a word about this. Number one, often the regulations on human sexuality that are found in the Old Testament, namely Leviticus chapter 18, uh, that's the same chapter where they talk about instructions on slavery. And so the argument is brought up, well, look, if the church now knows that these regulations from Leviticus 18 on slavery are null and void, and we don't pay attention to those on slavery, can't we also ignore these commandments on human sexuality? And the answer to that is no, because of Acts 15. Acts 15 tells us explicitly for Gentile converts which of the Old Testament commandments we have to keep and which can we let by the wayside. And the rules about sexual purity and chastity we have to keep. The rules about slavery are no longer necessary. Now Paul himself uh, tells, you know, slaves obey your masters and things like that. But there is a dichotomy. Paul is living in a time when he is trying to convert the world. And you've got slaves and masters. So if you're a slave and you're working for a master, as a Christian, Paul's telling you, behave yourself, be a witness, and maybe you can convert people and you can convert your master even. Okay, that's Paul's idea. But here, I want to be clear what happened. Philemon is a Christian. In fact, he's a fairly well-to-do fellow, and he hosts a church. He has a house church. He's the host of it. It's his house. Onesimus was his, or is his, I should say, slave. And Onesimus had converted 
and run away and had gone to follow Paul and help Paul. And Philemon wants him back. It's his property. And Paul writes him this letter. And what he's explaining is, gently, Onesimus is my good servant. And in the order of the church, Onesimus is a little higher in authority than Philemon. Of course, secularly, Philemon owns Onesimus. And the argument that Paul is trying to make is, brother, did you not hear my letter to Galatians? Ain't no slaves nor free in the church. If you're a Christian and Onesimus is a Christian, then he is your brother. And you can't own him. You cannot own a fellow Christian. And then that calls into question. Well, which is more important? Your identity as a Christian and what you know is right and wrong as a Christian or your secular identity and what is right and wrong according to the law? Is the law more important to you? Or is your faith more important to you? Now all of us, I hope, read this letter. And we want to love Brother Philemon into accountability. And say, Philemon, you, you got to free Onesimus. He's your brother in Christ. Be a Christian. Treat him as your equal. That's your ultimate identity. That's where you've got to decide you really are. Deep down at your core, I am a Christian, and therefore that has going to change the way I live my life in the secular realm. But the alternative is Philemon chooses to hold his secular identity most close, and then that affects how he lives his life as a Christian. And so which is it going to be? Is your Christian life, is Philemon's Christian life going to affect how he lives in secular society? Or is Philemon's secular status as owner going to affect his Christian life within his church as to whether or not he owns one of the fellow members? Onesimus, by the way, would later become Bishop Onesimus in the early church. Um... This is a question for all of us. Now, fortunately, we're not dealing with slavery anymore. And, and I just want to say this. The right thing, obviously, as a Christian for, for Philemon to do is to free Onesimus, make him his civil equal, which is in keeping with their status as Christians. That's building the kingdom of God, right? Here, the reality, my spiritual reality is that I'm equal to this brother so that I need to make that the physical reality, okay? Here's what the spiritual reality calls me to be is an equal, and therefore I need to build that out on the earth and be a physical, secular equal, all right? That's a tough thing because that's going to cost Philemon, right? He's going to have to give up without, probably without any monetary compensation, a slave. You no, know, brother, pick up your cross. It's, it's going to cost you to build the kingdom of God. It's going to cost you. Christianity is not a free ride. So um, that's the right thing to do. Now, you know, we let me just tell you, the church has struggled with this. I mean, we haven't always read Philemon very well, and uh, I didn't, we didn't, I never even really read it much until I went to seminary, and we really had to unpack Philemon. Um, here's the deal: if you believe in Jesus Christ, that's going to, it's going to have to change the way you live in the world. Okay, if you believe in Jesus Christ, that's going to have to change your views. On right, on, on right and wrong in the world. So um, that there's a lot to that. 
okay? There's a lot to that. But it is understanding that God is calling us. We're the clay. We are his people. And so God's going to use us as for his purposes, as his vessel, as his instrument, because he's trying to save the world. All right? So, you know, the, the hammer don't get to pick which nails it hits. He goes where the carpenter hits, sends him. Now, uh, the nail, you know how nails are, though. I thought about this because I hadn't, I hadn't swung a hammer with any regularity since I was a much younger man. But uh, I did know this about hammering some nails. Uh, now, it takes practice. I mean, the more you hammer, the better you get at it. But there are just some nails that I'm convinced they just don't be crooked. I mean, they're just not going to go in straight. You can try and pull them out and bend them back. You can try all kinds of stuff. Um, but there's just some nails that are just not going to go straight. That ain't the hammer's fault, necessarily. But as the hammer, our job is to go and do what the carpenter tells us to do. And you could try and have hit every nail in. You know, he's trying to build the kingdom, right? He's trying to save souls. Uh, and our job is to faithfully just try to do, be his tool, be his instrument. All right. Um, all of us are kind of in Philemon's position. Not necessarily about slavery, but about any multitude of issues of morality where there is a secular answer and there is a spiritual answer. And they're sometimes in conflict. And as I said earlier, all of us live in compromise because we do live in a world. We do live in society. There are only two parties, political parties in America, that are going to ever get elected. I mean, that's just the way. You can vote Green Party or Libertarian, and they ain't going to get elected. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I wrote in my vote before because I just didn't like my options. And so that's, you know, kind of a protest. Here's what I think. And that's your right as an American. But that guy's probably not, or Portland is not going to get elected. Um, it's one or the other. And so all of us are making compromises at some level. Here's the thing, Christians. When we forget that we are making a compromise... When we get behind one party or the other or one candidate or the other 100% and feel like, yes, morally, I'm completely on board with this, then we're buying into the morality of the world. If you don't have some reservation on either side, Republican or Democrat, uh, you're buying wholeheartedly in the morality of the world. And I guarantee you Jesus would have critiques of both sides. Both sides. Um, and the question being, um, what is Jesus calling us to? What is right and wrong based on what Jesus has taught? We're told repeatedly, lean not on your own understanding. Because my own understanding is limited, right? Um, we have to think about what is Christ's teaching what is the teaching of the church that's totally in keeping with John, what John Wesley said right when we approach any kind of moral issue we use what Albert Outward called the Wesleyan quadrilateral but basically what does scripture teach what is the tradition of the church then logically what follows and finally what does the gathered experience of the church inform us what does that have so um, I want to be clear Look, Jesus told us to be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. We need to understand both sides. But you've got to be able to say, well, here's the Christian answer. And here's the worldly answer. And we have to do our best to live out the morality of the cross. We have to do our best. That's what we're called. Because that's our ultimate identity. That's what's permanent. Okay? And so, you know, uh, people who think, well, I can live my Christian life over here. Christian morality is for the word of the church. But then we live in the world and I have, no, 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 no. That don't work because 
Philemon challenges us because for Philemon, the implications are very much secular. Are you going to free this fellow and make him your equal and treat him as a brother in Christ because that's ultimately who you are? Or are you going to say, well, that's, that's nice on Sundays and, and that's, that's kind of a hobby I play at, but really we live in the world and, and, and what's in the world is what's real. Well, then you've given up the kingdom. So where, where do you live? And it, and it boils down to what Christ said, where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is an economic reality for Philemon. If you're going to hold on to that slave, your heart is in the world. If you're going to give that slave up and it costs you that money, but you give him his freedom and you treat him as an equal brother because that's reality, your heart is in the church. So, uh, you know, in the South, and I've talked about this before, I mean, the Methodist Church split just prior to the Civil War over slavery. We were wrong in the South. The Methodist Episcopal Church South was wrong. John Wesley abhorred slavery. To, to call oneself a Methodist and to have held on to slavery was absolutely hypocritical and nonsensical. It was unintelligible. Um, just absolutely oxymoronic. But uh, they did, and uh, it split the church. Um, because they held on to the economic reality of slavery rather than, here's the vision of the kingdom. So they, they, they anchored themselves to the world. We have to ask ourselves those kind of questions today. On all manner of issues, some of which obviously are political issues. But the chief concern of the church is not politics. It's of morality and salvation. How are the people of God to understand and live out right and wrong? By the word of God. The world, we should know this, cannot see rightly. It is broken by sin. We are the ones who are supposedly believe that Christ came as the light of the world and calls us to be the light. Therefore, we can see properly by divine revelation. The world doesn't have that. So the answers that the world comes up with on how to solve problems and what is right and wrong, look, they're going to be flawed. They're going to be flawed. And we have to trust that Christ can see rightly. He created the world. He sustains the world. He will deliver the world. He is eternal. He's always been here. He came and died for our sins. He's all-knowing and omnipotent. So if he says this is right, we have to trust that it's right. And according to church history, Philemon is, is Saint Philemon because one of the things he did was give up Onesimus as a slave and Onesimus became bishop. And he did live into that vision of the kingdom. Now I want to close today with the gospel um, because I think it kind of undergirds what we've been saying today. And Jesus says it so starkly, so starkly, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. In other words, uh, number one, and this is very stark, 
But when he talks about mother, father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and your own life, he's obviously talking in some ways metaphorically, but he's basically saying even your closest attachments in this life and in this world have to be given up in favor of your identity in the kingdom of God. Even that which you hold most dear in this world is still of this world. And you've got to forfeit that. Now, um, I know that sounds stark, especially when he starts talking about family. But here's the thing. Uh, when I was about three months old, maybe, maybe just about three months old, my mom and dad had me baptized. They did the same for my brother. Uh, I did the same for my children. I had them baptized. And what does that mean? Baptism means you die to self and are raised with Christ Jesus. In a spiritual way, it's handing over your children and saying, they don't really belong to us. We're giving them to you. We understand that you're then trusting us to raise them in the church, but we're giving their life to you. My mother and father did that, uh, and I did that for my children. And said, Lord, uh, they're yours. They're yours. Uh, I'll, I'll try to take care of them, but they don't belong to me. They belong to you. Because if I try to hold them as my own, I'm going to lose them. The only, the only way we keep our lives is to lose it. Christ is explicit about this. So... Um, even though, yes, no one, none of us in, in Christendom think about, oh, I have to hate my mother and father. He's not speaking to those of us in Christendom. He's speaking to those who would have to convert and choose, do I live out the truth of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, or do I hold on to my familial attachments? Because if I, if I don't, I'll be rejected by my family. And, and you better, he, when he talks about, you better think about it, uh, he's saying, you know, if it's a builder, if he's going to build, he's got to think about it. Those, you, have, you better think about what you're going to be giving up. You better think about the consequences because this is a serious commitment. Because what Christ is trying to tell you is there, there ain't no halfway here. There ain't no one foot in and one foot out of the kingdom of God. There's no middle ground. Either a sheep or a goat. Your wheat or your chaff. One of the two. There's no neutrality here. Um, in fact, I, I think, well, gosh, was it was it a great uh, 20th century preacher, Tozer, or uh, or maybe maybe it was R.C. Sproul who wrote, "There is no more miserable creature uh, than one who is halfway in the kingdom and halfway in the world. You will be successful at neither. You will fail at both." And 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 there is, you know, John Wesley called it the almost Christian. Uh, that was his famous phrase. In fact, in one of his most famous sermons, the almost Christian. The guy who's, who's mm, he goes to church and he, he's, you know, he's, he, but he's, uh, ultimately, when, he, when push comes to shove, where does he understand his ultimate identity? Am I here in the kingdom? Or, or am I really deep down in the world? Push comes shove. If I'm Philemon, do I free Onesimus and recognize him as my brother in Christ and equal? Or, or do I keep him as slave and just let him go to church on Sunday? Where is my ultimate identity? Philemon hosted the church in his house. Philemon probably believed in Jesus sincerely. I mean, he was... But deep down, what's real? So, so that's the question that I think the gospel poses for us this morning. And so on behalf of Jesus and the gospel, I want to have to ask you, um, this is not a message about salvation. Presumably, all of you who are watching this are probably believers in Christ. But the question is, where is your identity really? Are you a citizen of the kingdom or are you really a citizen of the world where is your identity 
And on issues of right and wrong, do you line up with Jesus? Or do you think that the concerns of the world might override the mandates of the gospel? And if you do, if you honestly believe that, well, the world is a complicated place, and I don't know that the beatific vision of Christ really is a little bit naive, then you might want to think where your citizenship is. Whose side are you on? Are you with Christ? And is the kingdom of God your ultimate identity? Or are you with the world? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's close today with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.